I always get caught up watching the video and forget it's my cue. <laughs> Good morning. If I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, my name is Wayne. I'm the interim pastor, and it's a real privilege to be here uh, with you today and to uh, be able to share God's word. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 4, uh, beginning with verse 7 today. We're going to be kind of jumping around, so uh, you can keep your Bible open to that passage. The verses, will, I think, will all be on the screen uh, if you would uh, like to just follow along there. But I hope, hopefully you'll have that opportunity to, to do so uh, with, your, with your own Bible. Um, it was, uh, got back, uh, this, this past week again and, uh, plugging back in my days were all a little bit, uh, weird because I usually don't come in on a Wednesday. And uh, so I've been, been thinking uh, like two or three days behind all week, but, uh, uh, being with my wife this last week, we got away for a few days and just reflecting how much she enjoyed, uh, being here at Vista and getting to know, uh, the people here. And uh, we're looking forward to her, her coming back. Um, a little bit more about myself since I'm so new, and a lot of people ask a lot of questions. Uh, Carrie and I, we actually got married in college. I'll never forget that conversation with our kids. They're good with math, so they should have been able to figure it out, that we got married when we were 19. And uh, they could hardly stand that picture. You know, it was like, oh. And uh, right before the junior, our junior year of college, and our son was actually born um, uh, my last semester of college. So, you know, we like to do things the hard way, difficult way. Uh, but uh, we'll be married uh, for 48 years pretty soon um, and uh, a long time. But, uh, you know, I remember dating and stuff. You know, we were broke college kids. We were paying our own way through school. Um, we were, you know, paying our own living expenses. We were basically on our own uh, when we were 17, 18 years old. And, um, uh, you know, our dates considered of going to Jim Dandy's and uh, sharing a glass of iced tea and having long talks. I don't know if Jim Dandy's like that or not. Every so often we could even get a little pizza or something. But, but life was difficult, but, but it was good those early days. We were so much in love, you know. And um, our son was born, uh, like I said, when I, my last semester of college, um, finished up college and ended up in a church in Louisiana. And a couple years later, uh, our daughter Christine came along. And uh, um, uh, so, you know, life started kind of early for us in the whole uh, adulting um, kind, of, kind of stage of life. But um, so enjoyed our kids and everything. And um, so here's, here's a picture of Chad and Christine when they were born. Go ahead and put those up. Uh, Chad, not the greatest pictures, but they were old, you know. Um, Chad's on the left. He was four pounds, five and a half ounces. He was a preemie. And uh, his grandfather, we moved to Louisiana, and his grandfather called him Swamp Rat. <laughs> For many years, in fact, Chad still remembers that. Um, but yeah, that little onesie was a, like, you could fit two or three of him in that little onesie. Uh, but that was, and then Christine on the right, she's born with black hair. And now she's long, blonde, curly hair. But, um, yeah, you know, after our son, it was a surprise. He was, he was a little more difficult than Christine was. And they might be watching this, so he might get even with me. But, uh, um, but um, you know, life was good with the little ones. And, and we loved, we enjoyed it. But, you know, here's, here's the idea. This wasn't our goal in having children. You know, I mean, as wonderful and as precious as that looks, that wasn't our goal as parents, just to have babies. Here, here was our goal. Go ahead and show the next slide. So, wow. <laughs> There's our son on, on that side, on the left, and that's Chad. And uh, Amber is his wife, and then Avery, uh, she's 10, and Ella, uh, she's 8, and then on the right-hand side is our daughter, Christine, and her husband, Mike. And there you have a picture of Madison, who's 12, and then Noah and Oliver, who are twins, identical twins. And uh, if you look at them, you know their, their initials are N-O. So either it's no or it's reversed, it's on. It's one of the two. And, and of course, there's Chase doing the photobomb uh, right in the middle. But that was our goal, see? As parents... Our goal was not the baby. 
our goal was to see our kids grow and mature both physically, emotionally, and yet spiritually and reproduce and grow their own family. You know, young adults don't understand this, but you know, I know that when you start having your kids, your parents pay more attention to your kids than they do to you. Okay, that's just the reality. You just got to accept it and go with it. They still love you. They still love you, mostly. But they adore those grandkids because there's something about your children's children. Your children's children. And here's the thing we need to understand. As Christians, God's goal for us was not baby Christians. The goal of, of God the Father is that we be become spiritually mature Christians, growing and multiplying, reproducing others from our, from our own selves. We would reproduce other followers of Jesus Christ into this world. And it wouldn't just be one generation, but it would be two generations and three generations and four generations generations. God wants us to become spiritually mature, reproducing followers of Jesus. So the question is, I want to try to answer today, is so what does that look like? And how do, how do we go about doing it? Well, let's start with verse 13 of, of Ephesians chapter 4. It says this, this will continue, and we're going to go back, by the way, and look at everything else, but just want to go right to verse 13. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Now, let me just ask you to pause for just a minute and think with me. Think with me for just a minute. If, if you had some kind of a hero, all of us had some kind of a hero growing up. Someone we, we look to as, a, as an example in, in our lives. Someone besides Superman and, and Batman. <laughs> you know, we all, well, our, yeah, my grandkids went through that stage, you know, and, and I went through that stage. But, but those, someone in your life that you look towards, think, think about that for a moment. Some people want to know, why am I such a huge Green Bay Packer fan? I grew up in Northwest Iowa, it was part of it, but, but also up in that area, you have the Green Bay Packers, and during my growing up years, this will age me a little bit, you had Bart Starr and Vince Lombardi. Amen. Now, who else could, you could see right, about right down here? <laughs> the day I walked into their house, because I stayed with them for some, some time, they, they're all Green Bay people, so we just meshed so well. <laughs> I mean, who else would you be for? other than Bart Starr and Vince Lombardi. I mean, they were like the gold standard of, of football back in those days. There was, in my life, there was J. Larry Jackson, uh, Dr. J. Larry Jackson. He was one of my professors in college. And he's actually the one that really set me on um, target for what my life would really become about all the way back in college. I can still remember the class session that J. Larry spoke the, these words. He said, the mark of a great leader is a leader who leaves other leaders in their place. And I thought to myself, oh, I want to do that. I want to do that. I had no idea what a leader was at that time, but hopefully I figured that out a little bit. But I think back to the days and, and just, I, I, took, I took a second major on just because I wanted to be under J. Larry Jackson and sit under his teaching. And for years, I would call him up. Whenever I had a, an issue or a problem, I'd call up Jay Larry. And he was always so welcoming and, and willing to talk. Then there was Sherman and Ellen Horton. <laughs> Sherman and Ellen taught the young adult Sunday school class at the church we were a part of. And in that particular town, there were a lot of 19 and 20 and 21-year-old married college students. And Sherman and Ellen just took us under their wings and they, they taught us and they, they coached us and, you know, they counseled us and, you know, they told me several times, Wayne, don't be stupid and stuff like, you know, it was just phenomenal. And being able to reconnect with them and to hear them from time to time. Dennis Wood, my, my, college, my high school and college pastor modeled for me what it meant to be a man of God and, and to be a disciple maker. He demanded in high school that we become disciple makers. 
think about who your person might be. Real quick, turn, turn to your neighbor real quick and just say, tell, tell them who your person is in one quick sentence about it. Go ahead. I know that we don't do it, we don't talk in church, but just you could talk in church. Who would be your one person? Everybody has one person, right? We all have that. We all have that person that we look to and we go, you know, they really, really helped me move in life. Here's the thing we need to understand, though. It is important as those people were in our lives. As important as those people were in our lives. They're not the gold standard for which we need to be living our lives up to. They're not the gold standard. They might have been used by God, but they're not the gold standard. You see, the Bible tells us that if we're going to live as a mature Christian, that we need to measure up to Jesus Christ And in doing so, when we begin to fashion and live our lives to the gold standard of Jesus Christ, we will become on that journey. I don't know if I can ever say I'm a mature Christian. I'm a maturing Christian. We will be maturing Christians. So how do we go about doing that? What does, that, what does that look like practically? So I love this, this, this part of Ephesians. It's so practical. So let me just, let me back up a little bit and look at verse 14 first and say, so what does an immature Christian look like? All right, because sometimes that'll, that'll catch our attention. Verse 14, it says, then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Now, in the world, we know this, that our children have certain characteristics uh, as children. And if, if we, not, as parents, part of our job is to work with our children and help them move through and understand and, and become mature, functioning adults in our world. But, you know, there's some characteristics that actually pr- will produce immature adults. You can actually Google that question and come up with these. Isn't that interesting? Uh, one is being selfishness or entitlement aggravating others my three brothers and I never did that <laughs> much you know when you put four boys in the back seat of an air conditioned car on a on a 1200 mile road trip you got to expect that right <laughs> aggravating others needing to be the center of attention not taking responsibility for actions being irresponsible with money you see when, if we don't help our children learn and, and grow and mature in those areas, they will become immature adults. In the same way, spiritually immature Christians, um, and, and Paul describes them very, very succinctly here, immature Christians, Paul says, are gullible to strange doctrines. We're willing to take on anything. We listen to anything. We, we read. We look for ways to trip things up. We, we take on, immature Christians will take on strange doctrines. They'll be gullible to them. And they'll follow after certain things and, they, and their lives will get in trouble because they believe things that aren't the truth. The problem with immature Christians are looking at the wrong standard. The standard is Jesus Christ and who he is and what his life was on. So Paul moves on to verse 15 and he begins to instruct us. So what does a mature Christian look like? What does a mature Christian look like? He says this, verse 15, Instead we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. Well, there's so much in that, in that passage right there. We could, we could spend, there's like three or four phrases. We could spend a week on each one of those phrases. We're not, but we could, all right? So let, let's look at it. He said, so, so he's saying here, Jesus needs to be the standard, okay? Notice he says, growing in every way more and more like Jesus. So our goal is to grow and become like Jesus, 
So when you read your Bible, here's, here's a standard for, for part of my theology is this. That we have to interpret the, 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 the scriptures through the work and life and ministry of Jesus. He's our standard. So when we read scripture, we, we're, I, 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 when I read scripture, I'm looking, I'm going, okay, what does this scripture help me know more about Jesus? How did Jesus measure up to this scripture? How do I need to be a part of this scripture? We need to grow more and more like Christ. In other words, his life is what our life should begin to look like. Notice in, 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 in the Bible, in Acts, it talks about the fact that, that there were these group of people in Antioch that got together on a regular basis, and the Bible says they what? They were first called Christians in Antioch. They were first called Christians in Antioch. You know what the word Christian means? It's just like Christ. They looked at these people, these, these people who weren't followers of Christ, looked at this church, looked at these people, and they said, huh, they're acting a lot like Jesus. It's a pretty good testimony, isn't it? They're acting like Jesus. Huh. When was the last time we had someone say to us, you're acting like Jesus? <laughs> now, there's a lot of passages of Scripture. We're not going to go into these today. This is what we could spend time exploring, and we probably will explore a lot of these in the future. But they're the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians. You know, Galatians talks about the fruit of the Spirit. Jesus measured up to all of the fruit of the Spirit. Okay? Love, joy, peace, whatever it says, Jesus measured up to that. Do our lives measure up to that? Jesus says, if you want to follow after me, if you want to be like me, you have to be willing to take up your cross. There's one. That doesn't sound a lot of fun, does it? We need to be a humble servant. Jesus washed the disciples' feet the very night that he was betrayed and arrested. He washed his disciples' feet and he told his disciples, you need to go do the same thing. If we're going to be like Jesus, we need to be humble and, and serve. We need to be obedient to the Father. Jesus says, I don't do anything outside of what the Father tells me to do. It's a pretty strict standard, isn't it? Obedience to the Father. And then, and, and we might do this series, um, but, but all the qualities of the sermon, read the Sermon on the Mount. <laughs> that, is, that is Jesus' manifesto to the world about what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. He, the word, the Bible gives us everything we need in order to model and fashion our lives after Jesus. Now, in this passage, Paul talks about, about the speaking the truth, okay? Now, this word speaking here actually can be interpreted as to speak or maintain the truth. That would be kind of the Greek meaning behind that, to speak or maintain the truth, to act truly and sincerely. So, mature Christians will not only seek to fashion the lives after Christ, but they will speak the truth in love, but will also live the truth in love. Okay? Speak the truth in love and live the truth in love. It has to be both. Okay? It has to be both. And we'll do this as we realize that Jesus is the truth. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So, Here's, here's the thing. If you're speaking the truth, who are you speaking about? Jesus. We want to get caught up in a lot of the other thou shalt or not, thou shalt not, and those are truth. But see, when we do the truth in love, we're actually speaking and teaching and, and talking about Jesus. He is the truth. He's the truth. So if we're speaking the truth in love, then we are going to be giving witness to the person and work of Jesus. Speak the truth in love. We need to speak the truth in love. We need to be loyal to that truth in all that we say and do. We need to be loyal to the truth. But it has to be done with love. You see, you can't separate the people from the principles. Both, both are vital. So here, here's the thing. 
And this isn't, well, this phrase is in your notes, but it's not all there. So, so look at this. Spiritually mature Christians will tell the truth with kindness and helpfulness flowing out of love. Sometimes I find myself in situations that, um, that I want to um, say something. And, and what I'm learning to do, learning, relational wisdom, by the way, is really helpful in this, okay, is, is I stop and ask myself the question, if I say this, will that be helpful? Sometimes the things would be true, but at that particular moment, I have to stop and ask myself the question, will this be helpful for this person at this time? Sometimes it's just real easy to speak the truth. Boy, I'm going to nail that person. They need to hear some truth. Right? The question is, can they hear the truth? Will it be helpful to them to hear what I am going to say at this particular moment? We need to speak the truth in love. You see, truth without love is fanaticism. Okay? Love without truth is sentimentality. Did you see that? that? That was a huge learning for me. If I, if I talk about truth without love, I, I get fanatical. But if I just want to be all about love and not about truth, then I get to be very sentimental. It takes both working together. We have to hold these in tension. See, sometimes, you know, we, we look about truth and about love as kind of being at two different ends of the spectrum. In the scripture, we're going to talk more about this as we go along, but the, the scripture actually challenges me to live in a tension that is uncomfortable. And speaking the truth in love sometimes is, is un, uncomfortable, but I have to keep both of those things in tension. I have to keep them in tension so that it would take definite steps in my own life or those I'm discipling in growing in Christ-likeness and living it out practically in the world in which we live. We have to keep those two things in tension constantly. We have to approach, as I've already said, what will bring us closer to Christ. As we have this conversation, as we're studying this, as we're, we're seeking the truth in love, we have to ask the question, will this conversation and how we're having this conversation grow me and the other person, whether it's my wife or my friend or someone I'm discipling, will it grow us closer to Christ and to one another or will it separate us? Will it bring unity or will it bring division? Will it bring unity or division? And again, <laughs> Relation to Wisdom 360 is really helpful in this. If you've not enrolled, you need to get to be a part of it. So how do we do this? How do we move towards maturity? Well, let's jump back up to verse 7. However, he has given each one of us a special gift through the generosity of Christ. That is why the scriptures say, when he ascended to the heights, he led a crowd of captives and gave gifts to his people. Notice that he says he ascended. This clearly means that Christ also descended to our lowly world. And the same one who descended is the one who ascended higher than all the heavens. So he might fill the entire universe with himself. Now let me just pause real quick and say that, that little, those little verses right there raise a lot of questions. We're not going to answer those questions today, okay? That's a whole nother series, all right? So we're not going to go there today. Just know it. Live in the tension. Here's, here's, here's the importance I want, to pull, want you to pull out today. Their responsibility is to equip God's people. I'm sorry. Back up. So that he might fill the entire universe with himself. The question is, this happens so that the whole world will know and recognize Jesus as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He fills the universe with himself. Everything becomes about him, not about us. It becomes about him. Not about us, about him. Now, he says, verse 11, these, these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. 
All right? So there's a whole lot of stuff in that passage, and we're going to cover this in just a few minutes. So hold on. All right? So Jesus has given the gift to the world of his church. The church is a gift to the world, all right? It's a gift to his body, to the community. Can you imagine if we were all Christians trying to function individually without one another? Can you imagine what that would be like? It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be, sometimes we think, well, I don't need church. Oh, you need it. If you're going to grow in Christ, you need the church. You need one another, okay? So, so he's given the church as a gift to the body, but he's given the church the gift of leaders whose sole responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the body. I didn't say that. The scripture did. So my task, this task of our pastors, the task of our staff, is not to do the work of ministry. I had a friend who, who went to a new church, the pastor, and he stood up on the first day and he said, well, I just want you all to know I'm resigning as your minister today. Of course, it was the first day. He's like, <sighs> What do you mean? I'm your pastor, but I'm not the minister. God has called and he want, desires the church, the leaders of the church, to equip every person for the work of ministry. Turn to your neighbor right now and look him in the eye and say, you're a minister. All right. We got past that. Cool. So how do we do that? What's, what's our role? How do, how do we help equip the church to do this practically? Okay? So here's, here's some phrases. You have them in your notes there. To become spiritually mature, you must, first of all, adopt Jesus as a standard of truth for your life. We've already talked about that. But that simply means this, to become a follower of Christ. You can't become like Christ until you become a follower of Christ, until you repent of your sins and you turn to Jesus as your Savior and your Lord, you, you, that's the starting line. Until you do that, you can't get off the starting line. You can't take a step down the road until you make that decision for Christ. Number two, you need to identify with Christ in his church. All right? And, and basically how we do that is through, through believer's baptism and church membership. So if you're a follower of Christ and you've never been, been immersed, if you've never been baptized, myself or Pastor Dennis or Pastor Stephen uh, would, would love to talk with you about what it means to be baptized, to become a follower of Christ. That's the first act that a Christian ought to, ought to undertake, baptism. And then there's church membership. Now, we are working right now, and you all who have been a part of the process know we're working on the church membership and some of that kind of stuff, and you'll be hearing more about that later. But being come a part of the body, identifying with the body of Christ is important because the church is God's way of, of, of redeeming the world to himself. That is plan A, B, C, and D, and anything after it. Isn't that, isn't that interesting? No, he chose imperfect people to do his perfect work. <laughs> wow. Number three. You need to be in Christian community. Look at Scripture. There were no solo Christians in Scriptures. You need to be a part of Christian. How do we do that? This is, this is great, okay? But, but relationships happen best in the con Spiritual change happens best in the context of relationships. How we do that here at Vista is, don't stand up and applaud is small groups. If you're not a part of a small group here at Vista and you want to be growing in, in, in your faith in Christ, you need to get to be a part of a small group. Pa talk to Pastor Dennis about that and he'll help you. We consider that to be a very, very high priority. In fact, let me just tell you right now. Here's how high a priority I consider it. If you say, Wayne, I have about an hour, hour and a half to give you once a week, what should I do? What should I come to? Every time I will tell you, join and become a part of a small group. What about something? No. Become a part of a small group because here's what I know. If you're a part of the small group, your life will begin to be changed over and over again, and you will make room for this. But you might be coming to this for a long time and never get into a group, and you'll experience minimal life change at best. Become a part of Christian community. And then fourthly, take your place in the mission of the church. 
we're going to be, we're developing right now a ministry survey that people are going to be able to sign up for and, and become a part of, of um, you know, different ministries, our kids' ministry, our youth ministry, our media ministry, um, hospitality ministry, all these different things that are going on right now in the life of the church, small group leaders. We have all these things that we're going to be, we're developing a, a questionnaire or a, a, yeah, I guess it's a questionnaire about what would you be interested in, and you'll be seeing that in the next, in the next several Weeks about how do we serve in the church and out of the church. We'll be doing a Vista Serves Day in June. Be looking for that. I don't remember the date off the top of my mind, but we're going to be doing a Vista Serves Day out in the community. And we're going to be fighting the greatest battle that ever happens in the world as we go and we're going to prayer walk through the streets all around Vista Church building. Okay? So we, we, we engage with one another in the mission of the church. I don't know about you, but I get excited with that. I can't tell. So what's the outcome? What's the outcome? Verse 16. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. How many of you would love to be a part of church like that? Man. Man. So you see, when the body begins to move toward Christian maturity, we are holding Jesus up as our standard. The body, his church, will fit together perfectly. It's like a, like a, a, a jigsaw puzzle. We were talking about jigsaw puzzles earlier. And, and my wife loves to work those, and I like to try to help her, but I try to fit pieces in places where they don't fit. We'll fit together perfectly. Perfectly. As one part of the body begins to grow and mature, it'll help the other part of the body grow and mature. We will become interdependent on each other. We'll need each other more and more. And the end result will be this. Vista Church, healthy and growing and full of love. Wow. Isn't that a prayer? Isn't that something that we desire? Father, we thank you right now for, the, for this passage of Scripture that so challenges us. Father, that it, 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 it just, God, it makes me excited about what the future is. As, Father, you are working in us to equip us and to move us forward. Father, you are calling out leaders to do that kind of work. Father, you are, are, are even now birthing vision and direction in the life of us as a church that we might, we might come together in that unity around who Jesus Christ is. Father, I pray for people who are here today that might not have ever, ever, Accepted Jesus as Savior. They've never declared that indeed Jesus is Lord. And so, Father, I just pray that they might take that step, that first step forward. And for others who might need to be a part of a group or following baptism, whatever it might be, God, I just pray, Father, that you would just work in our hearts and work in our lives. If you're here today and, and you don't know Christ or, or you have some other questions about this, um, I'm going to be down in the refreshment area. Pastor Dennis, Pastor Stephen are going to be down in that area. And um, we just encourage you to, one of our elders, the person you came with today, uh, talk to them about what it means to be a follower of Christ. If they, don't, if they can't help, come and, and have them bring, them bring you to us. We'll, we'd love to share with you. But all of us have a next step of faith right now. What is that next step of faith for you? What is it that God is calling you to be and to do? So, Father, we pray that you would just reveal that to us. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's stand together.